This is Beyond a Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Gary Smith. Welcome to a very special Beyond a Reasonable Doubt. And by popular demand, we have back my friend, friend of the show, Harmeet Dillon. Harmeet, how are you? I'm great. Good to be here. Thank you, Mark. I, uh, I love, you know, the um, one of the great things about uh, the, you is that you're back in the practice of law where you took a brief hiatus. And uh, I love having you in the law, even though we may clash on certain political things. When it comes to the law, you've got the best brain. So oh, thank, thank you. Thanks so much. So I, um, I think everybody wants to hear your perspective on the legal a topic or story of the day, which is, guess what? The, I guess, imminent indictment uh, by the Manhattan DA. Um, what's your immediate reaction? Give me some of your thoughts, and I'll tell you what some of mine are as well. Well, yeah, so let me lay the table a little bit. Um, I've been involved in this set of facts from a civil perspective for some time. My law firm, uh, my, myself and Mark Moiser and a couple of other colleagues you know have been involved in the tail end of Stormy Daniels' failed civil actions against President Trump, both for getting out of her NDA, which is the sort of subject matter of this uh, uh, grand jury, as well as for defamation. And in, you know, both of those cases ended up in tears, really. And to date, four hundred thousand dollars plus of attorneys' fees that we won for the former president. And there's one final fee petition pending. By, in the night. by the way, so that people understand, that was in the action. Um, that she originally filed, you then got attorney's fees basically on a cross complaint, right? Well, just defense, anti-slap, really. And so uh, you know, she filed a lawsuit that was frivolous. And then when President Trump called her out for, you know, saying that she'd been threatened, saying he didn't believe her, she sued him for defamation. And um, in in these cases, it's very complicated. They were filed in state court. Michael Avenetti filed these cases, and then other lawyers got involved and successor attorneys. The cases got sent to the Ninth Circuit as well. So these cases have been up and down the California Court of Appeals and up and down the Ninth Circuit twice. So we've gotten most of the attorney fee awards done, and we're just waiting for one final attorney fee motion from the Ninth Circuit based on her untimely appeal of part of this. So anyway, long story short, she's going to end up owing former President Trump, over half a million dollars. And uh, she tweeted out today, she's sitting on her horse farm and, you know, waiting was to see that what happens. A, was that, <laughs> I saw that tweet, and uh, I guess the, is she sh- uh, throwing shade because the president refers to her as horse face? Is that why no, she's... No, I think she genuinely is in, has a horse farm in okay. Texas. So in between you know, exotic dancer gig. She's, you know, an equestrian, I guess. But in any event, I, that to me as a lawyer, you know, as a lawyer, to me, that's interesting from, from a collection perspective. But anyway, uh, I <laughs> yes, so, I, I so, uh, funny you mentioned that, but uh, yeah, the, yeah, we so have, a, not- Harmony and I have our own inside joke, but the, yeah. so this is interesting to me because I hadn't thought of that until you just mentioned it. I remember when it was happening and I remember the, the I've read the ninth circuit uh, cases. How does that play into, if at all, any potential indictment? Because I would think it does. Of course it does. So, so here's my thinking. That's that I was where I'm getting to is that's witness number one in this grand jury. She's got an incredible bias. So first of all, she claims she added a relationship with President Trump. And then at times she she is actually in 2018 disclaimed it and said she never did, which is consistent with his story. But she sued him. She failed. She had her fame, you know, with uh, Avenetti's lawsuit. He stole her book money. So right. she's kind of I mean, if anybody would be a bitter embittered, you know, witness in a grand jury proceeding who would not be reliable to take her word at face value it would be this person. Oh, that's that's one witness. The other key witness. And by the way, I believe I read and obviously because of grand jury secrecy, you can't confirm it unless and until there's a thing that she zoomed in or had talked to prosecutors. Presumably my antenna was that they were going to have 
a cop introduce her statements by hearsay? Is that what you would assume? That I, don't, that I can't speak to. Um, but, but but I think she's. I don't think it's a secret that she's quote unquote visited the grand jury in whatever fashion multiple times. Uh, the other big witness is Michael Cohen, former lawyer for President Trump who breached his attorney-client privilege, who was uh, under the gun for tax evasion relating to New York taxi medallions that has nothing to do with President Trump at all, and who, um, as you may have seen this week on Tucker Carlson's show, uh, a lawyer who advised him uh, at the time that he was under pressure from the U.S. Attorney's Office, has basically recounted, which he's allowed to do because Cohen waived the attorney-client Yeah, let's and- stop with that for a second because it's so yeah. funny you mentioned that. That's where I was headed. Robert yeah. Costello, who yeah. he had, apparently there was an unsigned retainer he had consulted with. Some people may recognize the name because he also had a brief representation, I believe, with Rudy Giuliani, but by all accounts, a a uh, frontline uh, New York criminal defense lawyer. And apparently, the, as you said, Cohen waived any privilege. Yeah. And so he's attorney and he's a former federal prosecutor as well. So, you know, Costello said this guy came to us and at the time he was weeping. He basically said he would do and say anything to get out of serving time. And, you know, at the time all of this was happening, the New York attorney, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Southern District of New York, was very anxious to get to get President Trump, I believe. But both uh, Federal Election Commission, as well as these federal prosecutors determined that on the set of facts they were able to prove best case scenario, this was not any form of FEC violation or criminal. Yeah, federal let's criminal dig violation. into that for a second, because yeah. what. The I think this is the gravamen of, of at least one of the uh, defenses. It, was he doing this because he didn't want it revealed in the election? People have to go back in real time. He had already had Access Hollywood. So I I don't think that that was the concern that he was thinking about the election. I think what he is going to say and what their defense is, is no, I you know, my marriage was on the rocks. I didn't want Melania um, coming after me. Anybody who's been a married man knows that uh, story or can empathize with that. Well, look, uh, every sophisticated lawyer who practices law and has clients who are successful, C-level executives at corporations, we've all had situations where allegations are made and for the good of the corporation or the individual, you resolve them. The truth of them is irrelevant to whether you resolve them. It's a good business decision, generally speaking, to not have negative commentary out there about you. So, you know, any lawyer who raises their eyebrows, this is lying, frankly. This is a very commonplace tactic in the law. And the legal precedent on this type of issue was actually set with a Democratic senator, John Edwards from North Carolina, where um, the, the Obama administration came after Edwards, who I think was perceived as, frankly, a political threat to that form of politics. And yeah, he had a donor pay off uh, a, a former. Uh, he's now deceased. Uh, Fred uh, Barron, I believe, uh, who was a, uh, a frontline trial lawyer. Right. So so to the tune of a million dollars and they tried to go after him and they spectacularly failed. And the concept that most responsible election lawyers would say on either side of the aisle is if it's a pre-existing obligation that you would have had apart from running for office or a pre-existing consideration, it cannot be imputed to a campaign finance violation. And the converse is true as well. You cannot use as a matter of law campaign finance funds, funds you raise from third parties to, you're not even, I mean, I've, I've run for office myself. You, you, I got the training. You can't buy pantyhose. You can't pay for your regular grooming uh, with uh, those, those funds. You have to be very careful with them and only use them for campaign related purposes. So, he didn't use campaign funds for those purposes, and that's that's the position. So in any event, there is no federal crime here, uh, clearly. And so Alvin Right, Bragg, and I want to say something about that, too, sure. because I've seen a lot of commentary, and people have talked about, well, he was named in the Southern District uh, plea agreement at, or identified that's as— That's meaningless, right, Mark? Exactly that's what I was just going to say. 
to get their butt out from under. And, and frankly, we've seen multiple examples of this. I have another case involving a plea in D.C. and I have a civil matter coming out of it. And the federal prosecutors, for their own reasons, extracted commentary from the defendant in a plea that had nothing to do with what they pled guilty to for their own purposes. It had to do with shielding certain members of Congress from liability for something. And it was absolutely ridiculous. And so, yes, absolutely. The U.S. Attorney's Office uh, took it very kindly that Michael Cohen was willing to plead guilty to something that isn't a crime. That doesn't make it a crime. The fact that they extorted a statement from him does not make it a crime. So, well, by the way, a little commentary as well. Some of the biggest battles I've had in federal court have been over the factual basis for a plea agreement where the client says, I don't want to say this. And I tell them, you're going to be under oath. And they that I remember in the Southern District years ago going through three plea hearings because my client would not go to as far as what they wanted him to say on the the factual basis. Well, this guy's the opposite end. He would say anything uh, to to you know get out from under these charges, and these charges again had nothing to do with President Trump. The bulk of and, the and, 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 he pled guilty to had had nothing to do with it, and this was gratuitous, in my opinion. And so, but in any event, if there were a federal claim, it has passed the statute of limitations. So, what is Alvin Bragg doing, the District Attorney in Manhattan? Alvin Bragg is dredging up. A uh, fact pattern that numerous prior law enforcement and federal election officials have passed over. Much as they hated Trump, even Alvin Bragg's immediate predecessor did not prosecute this. And so the, the theory, we don't know exactly what the theory is because they haven't indicted yet. But as I said on Tucker Carlson's show earlier this week, reading the entrails of what the uh, DA's office is leaking to the New York Times it looks like they're trying to bootstrap a misdemeanor records violation for business record keeping onto a New York state election law violation, which would convert the record keeping violation into a felony from a misdemeanor into a which felony. Which is a, a very good point. You're, you keep anticipating what I'm going to ask you. It is a misdemeanor. But you have to kind of graft on for those who don't understand. How do you elevate the misdemeanor to the felony? You have to kind of basically, it's a hybrid of the two theories. And I agree with you. We don't know yet. There hasn't been a vote. Supposedly, the indictment is going to be voted on tomorrow on Wednesday. And But if everything, and by the way, it seems to be accurate so far that's being reported, it looks like it's a theory that's never been tested under New York law. Well, when it gets tested, if it gets tested, if, if Alvin Bragg makes this real abuse of process mistake here and in, in dragging this into court, uh, the couple of problems. Number one, Donald Trump has never run for any office regulated by New York election law. OK, he ran for a federal office. That's the only office he's ever run for. It's preempted by federal election law. And secondly, I think there is a dispute over the statute of limitations that New York state has a tolling during covid but this is a true i mean yeah, there's I also it's such that a are counter argument to tolling and so I, I i think this is really a problematic case and and then you have the specter of alvin bragg having run for office on the theme of getting trump and this is just so distasteful to me as a citizen taking the politics out of it I don't think it would be okay for a Republican to run for office saying that, and it's just an abuse of, of process altogether. So there are a lot of defenses. This is, I think, a case that is dismissible if it comes. And, um, you know, I, I won't say more about the legal strategy, but two of my wonderful partners, one former federal prosecutor and another who does white collar crime work, uh, are, are part of the tr- team here. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Well, I'm going to I'm going to impose upon you and bring you back uh, if we get more information for maybe a breaking news beyond a reasonable doubt. I appreciate it. Thank you for making time. I know how busy you are, and I'm going to call you later tonight. All right, perfect. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, and thank Harvey. you, thank you, guys. Bye, Gary. Bye, bye. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com/slash Reasonable Doubt Podcast.